Hi there. So today we're going to be looking at this wonderful tome. It's called You Can't Tell Me What to Do and Other Stories About Teenagers. It was written by Diane Carlson, 1978. And the copyright belongs to the Xerox Corporation, which calls it a Xerox Education publication. At the time, this was known as Riff or Reading is Fundamental. There's a wonderful book, it tells a lot of great stories about how you can't tell me what to do and other stories about teenagers. Today's story is called, You Can't Tell Me What to Do. First, let me get some uh, lubrication here. I'm gonna take a hard swallow here. <coughs> now that's a hard swallow. This will come in handy in a little bit. Let me tell you about these guys. There's a kid named Jim. Jim's dad is Mr. Russell. He's a police officer. Well, he's a police sergeant. And Jim has a friend named Charlie, and he's got a new friend named Mike, who's not all that good of a person. And there's a woman involved. She's going to be the victim. And there's a medic. That's kind of it. That's our cast of characters today. So. On September 30th, 2022, we're going to talk about You Can't Tell Me What to Do and other stories about teenagers. Keep in mind, most of these sentences ends with the words he said or she said or they said or whatever. So I'm going to read them. Just ignore them. No, I can't go bowling with you tonight, Charlie, Jim said. I've got other plans. See you around. I mean, who says see you around? It's not a nice thing to say to your friends at all. Really, you should say something like, you know, catch you later, or yeah, you know, call you, or, or, you know, let's hang out another night. You know, something, not see you around. He hung up the phone just as his father came into the room, buttoning the last button on his policeman's uniform. Hey, I thought you liked to bowl, his father said. It's okay, I guess, Jim said. I'm just not so crazy about Charlie these days. Well, most teenage boys aren't really crazy about their teenage boyfriends these days anyway. So there you go. He seems like, well, such a kid, I guess. Yeah, well, when you're 14 or 15 and you hang out with 14 or 15 year olds, you're, you're all just a bunch of kids. And remember that they're all kids. So later on when they're called men and then back again to kids or boys, we'll, we'll talk about that. All he's interested in is playing games. Well, aren't we all? I mean, Las Vegas games, casino games, football, basketball, car racing, you name it. We love games. Why is it wrong for kids just to want to play games? I think it's great. I suppose your new friend, Mike Bell, is more of a man, Mr. Russell said. Well, at least he's interested in something besides bowling. Oh, yeah, said his father, like driving 60 miles an hour in a 30-mile zone. Okay, so he's going 60 miles per hour. I understand. But uh, he's not doing it in a 30-mile segment of the road. That would be a 30-mile zone. He's doing it in a 30-mile-per-hour zone, which means he's going double the legally posted speed limit. Whoa, what a horrible criminal he is. Like, everybody speeds all the time. <sighs> we've picked him up for speeding twice in the last two weeks. The next time we get him, he'll lose his license. Whoa. Uh, if you do the math, it kind of works something like this. Uh, first time he gets caught speeding, that's bad. Second time he gets caught speeding, that's bad. And then the cop who stopped him twice tells his kid to tell his friend to stop speeding because if he gets stopped again, he'll lose his license. None of which has anything to do with how you lose your license. With every offense, you get a certain number of points on your license. And in this state, you have to have a lot of points within a year to lose your license. And two speeding events, and even three speeding events, do not cause you to lose your license. So I know this isn't Arizona for wherever these kids are, but uh, no, it doesn't work that way. Mike's a good driver, Jim said. He knows everything there is to know about cars. Oh, keep that in mind. Mike knows everything there is to know about cars. 
except how to dry them at a safe speed, his father said uselessly. It's a typical father response. You know, it doesn't help anything. It adds nothing to the conversation. Really, it's just prolonging the anguish of interacting and, and not useful. I'll tell you something, Jim. Mike Bell is no good. He'll keep on pushing until he gets in trouble, big trouble. Well, what pushing has he done so far? He's sped twice in two weeks. That's hardly pushing, and it's hardly going to get in trouble. That's just more fatherly useless talk. So please, Mr. Russell, stop. You're wrong, Jim said. You don't know, Mike. Just because you stopped him a couple of times doesn't mean he's a reckless driver. Oh, well, talk about red herring. So here we go. Jim has ratcheted things up a notch. His dad says that Mike was speeding twice. You know, it's like uh, speeding once, speeding twice. But Jim took it from speeding once, speeding twice, past careless, all the way to reckless. Well, Dad never said anything about reckless driving or careless driving. He just said the guy sped twice. Why would you say he's not reckless? Stupid. I've seen his type a million times, Jim's father says, out to prove to the world what big men they are. Don't hang around with him, Jim. Well, first they were boys, then they were friends, teenagers, now, now they're men. It's hard to figure out, but uh, telling somebody not to hang out with somebody just because you think they have to prove something because they sped twice? It seems like you're drawing a lot of conclusions from zero down. Is that an order? Yes, I don't want him dragging you down too. Well, who else is Mike dragged down? No one. So why would we say dragging you down too? Well, probably also would have been a better word, right? No. And secondly, once again, this is not how you talk to your children. And if they say, is this an order or a command? The answer isn't yes, it's no. I'm just trying to be helpful. Or something else that's true. Not, yeah, it's an order, so you must do it. Jim's voice got louder. Oh, Jim's voice did not get louder. Jim raised his voice. Let's put the energy into admitting that the Jim, whatever Jim's about to say, it's on him. Idiot. You can't tell me what to do. I'll make my own friends. No one said you couldn't make your own friends. Your dad's just telling you that this guy is trouble based on no information that he actually has, and he's going to drag you down too, or whatever. Listen to me, Jim. Mr. Russell's voice was more conciliatory than angry. Oh, well, let's try again. Listen to me, Jim. Mr. Russell's voice was more conciliatory than angry as he reached out to touch his son on the shoulder. I'm just trying to. Leave me alone, Jim pulled roughly away and stormed out of the room. Who did his father think he was anyway? I probably thought he was the father, which means he's paying for the room and the board and the food and the education and eventually a car and insurance, more education. So at some point, he does kind of get a say, don't you think? Who did his father think he was anyway? Just because he was a cop didn't mean he could read minds. Okay, once again, we're ratcheting things up from normal stuff to stupid stuff. Yeah, dad is a cop. Yeah, dad did say that was an order. At no point did dad say he could read minds. Did he imply he could read minds? No one talked about reading minds. So where does this come from? Jim is an idiot. Jim grabbed his jacket, went out the back door. Why the back door? What is he running from? Why not the front door? Isn't that where typically people go when they leave the house? It's not like he's running away and no one knows it. He just had a fight with his dad. Dad knows he's leaving. So why the back door? He had promised to meet Mike down at the corner, and Mike wasn't the kind of guy who liked to be kept waiting. Well, let me tell you, I have news for you. Here is the total number of guys in the world who love to be kept waiting. So Mike didn't like to be kept waiting. Probably Jim didn't either. I'm pretty sure his dad, the cop, didn't. I don't. You don't. Let's move on. Where is your car, Jim asked as he saw Mike leaning against Duffy's cigar store, a wooden match hanging out of the corner of his mouth. Wow. No good afternoon. No hi, Mike. No good to see you. No, hey, glad we could uh, get together. Just where's your car? Bad intro. 
won't start, Mike said. Battery's dead. I need money for a new one. Well, this is the guy who's supposed to know everything about cars. Battery's dead. Are, are you sure? You, you couldn't add like a detail, like uh, turn the key and the starter went click, 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 click. That's the starter relay, Mike, not the starter. Or tried to turn the radio on. It was totally dead. That, that might help. But just telling us won't start batteries, didn't need money. Okay. Thanks for solving that one. And what are you doing to get money? You're hanging out at the cigar store on the corner with a match in your mouth. Might as well light the match, light yourself a fire. Maybe you'll get money that way. But no, Jim has a better idea. Maybe you could get a job down at the Burger Palace, Jim suggested in a voice heavy with sarcasm. I hear they're looking for some handworking help, or hardworking help. Sure. When someone comes to me and says, my car doesn't work, my battery's dead, I need money. The first thing I say is, oh, well, you should get a job. You know, I say that to the dog all the time. I say, Yupa, Chabo, does the dog go get a job? He does not. Does he help with a, with a payment? No, he, he doesn't. And so Jim offering Mike this advice is uncalled for. Mike laughed. <laughs> it's just as well I'm not interested in a grind like that. I hear they look only at your legs before they hire you. Anyway, I'd never pass. Well, first of all, I'm not sure why he thinks people look up people's legs to, to hire them. And last time I, I was in the market, it was, you look at the resume, the experience, the attitude, and answers to simple questions. And then if he'd never pass based on his legs, I, I'm wondering what what is wrong with Mike's legs? I mean, obviously he can walk to the corner cigar store and he can stand there with a match in his mouth, so it can't be that bad, but won't pass bad legs yeah. the boys sauntered on down the street they passed a few kids from school who waved or said hello uh, which was it did they wave or did they say hello and how many were there and did they know either of these guys mike or jim we don't know was he imagining it or did these kids look at him with a new respect jim wondered mike had a reputation at school Nobody messed with Mike. It was true Mike didn't have many close friends, but that was because Mike was his own man. Once again, the boy's a man. Jim told himself, Mike, Mike's got guts, and guts frighten a lot of people. Wow, they certainly didn't frighten the boys who either said hello or waved. And we don't know whether they said hello or waved to Mike or Jim or both. So we really don't know if there's any newfound respect or anything, or if they're afraid of Mike's guts, whatever that is. Really, all we know is Jim just thinks way too much about things that uh, don't really matter. Well, Jim, Mike said, glancing up at the sky, it's just about dark, time to go to work. Well, the, the two of them are kind of hanging out together. They're walking around. I, I would think that Mike would notice it getting dark exactly like Jim would notice it getting dark and he doesn't need someone to tell him. Work, Jim said. What are you talking about, Willis? The easiest bread in Medford, man. Okay, so once again, they've gone from boys to men to teens to boys to men. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know where Medford is, but I'm pretty sure it sucks to live there, at least based on these losers. Mike said, I'm just a dedicated all-American boy working on the streets for a few bucks. You see all those beautiful suckers walking down the street? Half of them leave their wallets in their back pockets. The old ladies carry their pocketbooks under their arms. They're the easiest marks of all. I just swoop down, grab, then run off like a shot. Oof, let me take another hard swallow here. Oh, <laughs> run off like a shot, huh? Is that uh, shot of whiskey, a shot of tequila, a shot from a rifle, a shot from a pistol? Because I haven't heard the word run used with any of those. Nobody says ran off like a shot. They say took off like a shot, fired off the line like a shot, not run. Anyway, Jim swallowed hard. You know, I don't know what the swallowing hard is all about, but <coughs> so Jim swallowed hard. He hadn't bargained on this. Oh, I didn't know he was bargaining. I didn't know there was an auction going on. I haven't heard an offer to buy, an offer to sell. There's no meeting in the middle. There's no meeting of the minds. 
as a non-lawyer, I tell you that means there's no contract, no meeting of the minds, no contract, no bargaining. I, I don't know, he said. I don't think I'm fast enough for this. Well, you've never done it. You don't know how to do it. You haven't asked a guy who talked you into this to demonstrate it. So I don't know how fast you need to be. You don't know how fast you are. So I can say you're not fast enough for this. It's all wrong. Not chicken. Are you back, back, back? Mike said, his eyes narrowing to slits. Well, let's do that. Eyes narrowing to slits. You're not chicken, are you? Back, 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 back. Mike said, his eyes narrowing to slits. Afraid your old man will find out. At the mention of his father, Jim stiffened. He was still smarting from the conversation he had with him earlier. You kidding? He said. All right, Mike said. Hey, shut up. Look what's coming. Perfect. I don't want to say nobody talks like that, but uh, nobody talks like that. I'm going to read you the sentence one more time. Pretend someone said this to you and try not to laugh. All right. Hey, shut up. Look at what's coming. Perfect. The streetlights weren't on yet, but in the dim light, they could see an older woman coming down the sidewalk. Yeah, when you're 14, pretty much anybody coming down the sidewalk is an older person. Her arms were loaded with packages. Under one arm was a good-sized pocketbook. Like taking candy for a baby, Mike said. Just run out and grab it. She might not even feel you take it away. Why isn't Mike doing this? Okay, Jim said, sweet sweat beating down on his face, even though it was a cool fall evening. So he's gone from cool fall evening to sweaty face in like five seconds. He crouched beside the building until the woman passed by, then ran out behind her <clears throat> and grabbed at the pocketbook. The woman whirled around to face him. The packages went flying from her arms as her hands instinctively crossed in front of her face. Let's talk about that, okay? So you got lots of instincts. Normally the fight or flight reflex means you, you hit the person or you run away. In her case, apparently her instinct is to put her hands in front of her face. I've never seen that, not even in TV or the movies. Very special woman, indeed. In the dim light, Jim and Mike had not noticed that the pocketbook was not merely tucked under her arm, but held to her shoulder by a thick strap. We call that a purse. You're not a pocketbook snatcher. You're a purse snatcher wannabe. There you go. Don't, she screamed. Help, help. Of course, there's nobody there. I mean, these, these young men knew that there's nobody there, and that's why they were accosting this lady that they said was coming down the sidewalk. There's an empty sidewalk, empty road. Nobody's there. She's going, don't, don't, help, help. So she's going, don't help, don't help. I, not very helpful. She started kicking at Jim's shins and pounding on his chest. So I guess she must have taken the hands off her eyes so she could see him. Stunned by her attack, Jim froze. In an instant, Mike dashed out of the shadows and joined her. The streetlights lit up just as Jim heard the click and saw the glint from Mike's switchblade. The woman's face turned toward the light. Jim saw her face clearly. Fear was there. A look of terror that sent a shiver to the bottom of Jim's spine. He felt pity for the old lady and shame for himself. Mike, holding the knife upright, came up at the woman, holding the knife upright. So, you know, if we look at this USB stick and pretend that's a pocket knife or a switchblade, holding it upright seems kind of counterintuitive to attacking anyone. Normally, if you want to attack somebody, well, you extend the blade and you're going to go stab, stab, stab. Not, hey, I'm holding a knife. Take a good look uh, here. Look, it's a knife. Okay. Yeah, Mike's kind of a loser. So uh, if you didn't catch that before, now you know. Um, so Mike's holding the knife upright came at the woman from behind wants to fight does she uh, want to repeat yourself like uh, handicap uh, British humor do you makes no sense with a powerful shove Jim pushed her to one side she gave a startled cry and fell to the ground Jim grabbed for the knife but Mike caught off guard for only a moment reacted quickly to his unexpected enemy enemy well Two minutes ago, these guys didn't know each other. They were going to hang out for the first time. Then they were called friends. Now they're enemies. 
I mean, this front of me thing is just getting weird. He lunged at Jim. The knife punctured Jim's shoulder. So we got a puncture going on here. Uh, but with his other arm, Jim delivered a punch that sent Mike sprawling. The knife had fallen to the ground. Jim quickly reached down and picked it up. So there were fingerprints on that knife, and Jim just destroyed them. So obviously he hasn't learned much from his dad, the policeman, but whatever. Mac, Mike backed away. Rat, he yelled, dirty rat. Huge insult. And uh, ran off at top speed. So first he was running like a shot, which we're not sure what that is. Now he's running at top speed. So Mike's got, I guess, a couple of gears, top speed, and shots. Okay. Taking with him the pocketbook, it's a purse that had dropped to the sidewalk in a scuffle. Jim leaned over the woman. There was a heartbeat, but it seemed faint. Or was that only because his own heart was beating so badly? He tried to remember what he had learned in his health class about reviving someone whose heart had stopped. Keeping in mind, of course, the woman's heart did not stop. It was beating faintly. You do not perform CPR on someone whose heart is working. He pushed down hard on the old woman's chest a few times and then started mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing. Huh. Kissing an old woman when she's down. Good job. Within minutes, so hopefully he wasn't doing CPR longer than 30 seconds, the sound of sirens filled the air. And who called them? We don't know. The street was filled with medics and policemen and a crowd of curious people. Well, they're not very curious because none of them came up to talk to Mike or the lady or ask if she's all right. There was even a reporter from the local newspaper popping flashbulbs and talking rapidly to everybody in sight. Yes, I'm sure there was. That's the one a bald-headed man said to one of the cops. The kid in the striped shirt, he's the one who saved her. The kid who get, did it got away. Well, that's a good story. Jim was dazed and slightly dizzy when he saw his father pushing his way through the crowd. You okay, son? Sergeant Russell asked anxiously, putting his arm around Jim's shoulder. He drew his hand away. Hey, what's this? Sergeant Russell's hand was covered with blood. Guess that must be from that puncture earlier. He led Jim over to the curb and sat him down while a medic examined his wound. Surface wound, the medic said, bandaging the shoulder. Well, no, it's a puncture and it's bleeding. And in, usually when you're bleeding, it stops after a few minutes. But in this case, it's going on to the point that when dad puts his hand on him, he gets blood on and the medic had to bandage him up. So that's not a surface wound. He'll be okay. Just the same. You better take him down to an emergency and let him take a look. Well, if it's a surface wound, he's going to be okay. Why are you taking him to the ER? How about take him home and put a Band-Aid on it? Or if you don't like Band-Aid, the CVS brand or Scooby-Doo brand, whatever. That's not the right answer. But, you know, they're going to go to ER. And you, you can see, I mean, there's like three plus rolls of that bandage on that kid's arm. That is a big-ass wound. And if you want to say that's a surface wound, but except it's a puncture and it's bleeding all over dad's hand, uh, somebody out there is not quite getting the idea of what this is. Wait, dad, Jim said. There's something I got to tell you. No, actually, there's nothing at the crime scene you need to tell your dad or at the hospital. What you need to do is wait till you're in the privacy of your own home. Then you can do whatever confession you want without the presence of police or medical people. It can wait, his father said, helping Jim into the patrol car. No, it can't, Jim said, because he knows better. In a few short sentences, he told his father all that had gone on that evening. Mr. Russell looked grim, but made no comment. After hearing the story, he sent a police alert for Mike Bell. There's no such thing as a police alert. Right, you can send a, a bolo, be on the lookout. You, you can send out an ATL, that's attempt to locate. You can have a district attorney file charges, and then you can put out an arrest warrant, uh, but a judge has to sign that. That's why it's called a warrant. And do any of those things. He just put out a police alert. Father and son drove to the hospital. No, father drove to the hospital because it's a police car and son sat in the back where Jim was treated for his wound and then to the police station where Jim made a full report. Again, you know, it's one sentence. Reached for her purse. She fell down. Another guy came at me with a knife. He stabbed. He took the purse and ran. That's it. Pretty simple. He would have to, to appear in juvenile court. Why? He wasn't charged with anything. There's no warrant for his arrest. He's committed no crime for which he has been charged. Admittedly, attempted purse jacking is attempted robbery, but he hasn't been charged with it and likely won't be because he helped her. So he doesn't have to appear in juvenile court. 
he might as a witness against Mike, but they certainly don't have charges against him filed yet either. But his chances were getting of getting off on probation were very good. Probation for what? He hasn't been charged with anything. <sighs> don't talk to cops. The report from the hospital was good. The woman had suffered a mild heart attack, but she was going to be okay. As Jim and his dad were leaving the station, Mike Bell was brought in, handcuffed. Uh, that means he's under arrest, which typically means either they did file charges or they got found him doing something else. In this case, it's option B. On his face, he had the defiant look that Jim had thought was so great the short time they were friends. Got him right handed, the arresting officer said, trying to break into one of the cars to use card lock. Well, cops don't talk like that. They don't say, caught him trying to break into a used car. They would say uh, he was attempting to break into a 1986 Toyota Prius model 367 G4 or 5, and I had apprehended him prior to his entry into the vehicle. They wouldn't say trying to break into one of the cars. Would you look at that, Mike said when he noticed Jim and his dad together. It's the big boy scout and the little boy scout. I should have known you would chicken out when the chips were down. When Jim and his dad were in the car, Jim struggled to find the right words to say to his father. I'm sorry, Dad, was all that came out. Well, you ought to be, his father said uselessly. But I have a feeling it's not going to happen again. Yet another useless dad comment. Jim felt tears coming up to his eyes, but he pushed them down again with a great effort. Well, first of all, this is the first we hear of Jim crying, so I'm not sure where the again comes from. And the second is, you have tear ducts and tears come through them to your eyes you, you can't push them back down it's a one-way valve there is no matter what great effort you have when they got home the telephone was ringing it was charlie wanting to talk to jim how did charlie know when jim got home or had he just let the phone ring for 45 60 90 minutes and they're just sitting there going oh i can't wait till they get home <laughs> well, it's stupid they didn't have voicemail back in 1978 uh, I heard about you on the late news. It was you, wasn't it? Well, did you hear about him or is it him? Choose one. Don't just ask them both. Yeah, it was me, Jim said. Congratulations, Charlie said. You should have heard the guy talking about you. A modern day hero, he called you. He did. Yeah, Jim said without enthusiasm. Yeah, Jim said without enthusiasm. I wish I'd gone bowling. So the moral that we take from this very important lesson is you, you, you can't tell me what to do. I know the stories about teenagers. But if you have a choice between going bowling with your lame-ass friend or purse snatching with your soon-to-be enemy slash wannabe friend, probably you should get a hobby. And uh, that uh, concludes our uh, discussion for today. So long.